Good morning. Spring has sprung. That was uh, too cold in here? It's not spring yet. Says the lady from the deep south. <laughs> Um, we are continuing our testify series, and I have asked if uh, Josh DeBoer would be willing to come and share with us his testimony. So I am going to turn it over to Josh. First off, I just want to clarify, he did not ask. <laughs> All part of discipleship. <laughs> so, I grew up in a Christian home, and my parents are back there. I grew up in the Hillsboro, Oregon. I grew up going to church all my life. Um, when I was about six, I had my, my salvation experience, or what I thought was my salvation experience at the time. I said my little prayer. Um, I can actually still picture it. I was in trouble for something. I was in mom and dad's room, sitting on the bed. I can remember just, just saying that prayer and thinking I was in. And I pretty much thought I was saved from there on all the way up until I was about 15. So those uh, nine years. And um, during that time, those nine years, you know, I thought Christianity, I guess, you know, Pastor Lynn's been talking a lot, a lot recently about cultural Christianity, and that's really what uh, had the culture of Christianity. I knew the, the traditions, the rituals, the expectations of being a Christian in America. Um, all of my relatives, friends, acquaintances were all Christians, and we're Christian people, it was just part of life stuff. And uh, I didn't really notice it at the time, but what I really viewed Christianity was I had, so I had my life here, and this is, you know, my work family, play, so on and so forth, and then I saw this little, like, plug-in on the side, this little box of Christianity, and, you know, it had, it had, it had two things in it. It had the golden ticket to heaven, and then it had the little, I've fallen and I can't get up button. <laughs> so, that, that's really how I do it. <laughs> that's the best way I can put it in the course. So, during those nine years, I didn't really have any spiritual experiences. Um, there is one event that kind of stuck out to me, and this is a little bit odd, but I'm bringing it up because it's the only one I have those numbers. And I was about, I don't know how old I was, I'm going to say 10, and someone probably was pregnant in that, but uh, my mom's parents had a Bible reading contest for us kids, for all the grandkids, and there were eight of us. And there was, there was two divisions. There was an older kids division, there was an younger kids division. I was in the older kids division. Uh, there were five kids in the older kids division, and three in the younger kids division. We had from Easter one year to Easter the next year to read through. The older kids had to read through the entire Bible, and then the younger kids had to read through the New Testament. And so I jumped right into that, and then uh, Kate did too, and so did Nick. And I think I got through it in like five months. Kate thought it was eight. So I'm going to say three. Just <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and Kate got through it in like 11. Is that what you said? Something like that. Yeah. And I don't know about Nick. But all three of us kids got through it, and there, there were two things that really stuck out at me at that contest. One, none of the other kids even got past the first chapter in their reading. And that just kind of made me stop and think, you know, well, where are their priorities if they don't even have time to read the Bible? You know, what's important about their lives? And the second thing was, um, during that time, I didn't notice it until after, but during that time there was, there was a change, and I noticed I wasn't having to work as hard at deciding, you know, what was right, what was wrong. It was more automatic. And I didn't notice it until after when I started doing that the last, and I was like, oh, this is harder than it was then. So it was just kind of like, you know, this stuff might actually work. Um, so that's really the only memory I have all the way up until about 15 as far as spiritual events. Um, and when I was 15, we moved to Montana and started attending this church. I grew up in a Hillsborough region before that. And uh, right off the bat, I noticed there, there was something different about you guys. And I, I have my, my three-foot bubble, so everyone needs to stay outside of three feet of me. If you walk into this church and everyone's hugging and these people are hugging and these people are hugging, they're like, oh, <laughs> 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 so, that, 
<laughs> that was my first impression. And uh, but as time went on, I started to get to know you guys better. And uh, we're still here. <laughs> uh, I started to get to know some of you better and see into your lives and see the walks you had with Jesus Christ in a personal relationship. And I then started to realize uh, a lot through a Pastor Gunn's discipleship class that you know, my life was not going the direction it should be. I was not you know, following God. I was a cultural Christian. And it was a process of, of realization. It, just, it wasn't a light bulb moment. Um, it was probably a year and a half before I realized. Well, first, that, that my life wasn't right. And then finally, to the point of I didn't even think I was saved. Uh, I still don't know if I was or not at that time. It doesn't really matter. It's not relevant. But I still don't. Um, so after I realized that, then, then the struggle started of, you know, do I give everything up and, and follow Christ or do I keep going the way I've been, I've been going and try and muddle through life? And um, it, it, was, it was hard and it took me nearly two years before I finally came to the place where I could say, I'm done with this, I'm, I'm just going to follow Christ. And I finally did get, up, get to that place So then uh, it was a Monday morning I believe. I want to see Pastor Gunn, and I just told him, you know, I'm, I'm not saved, and I kind of want to fix that. And he said, okay, so we pray. And, yeah, you know, nothing was different. Like, you know, nothing changed. And over the last two years, I've had three emotional experiences that I can remember where I said, okay, God, I'm just going to give it all to you. But nothing ever changed. Nothing ever came out of those experiences. And this last time, I was just really kind of disappointed and, and let down. I was like, I don't know what else to do. And so, Pastor Glenn, we talked a while, and it didn't really help, so uh, he told me to go home and pray and be alone with God. So I did. I got home alone, and I read my Bible and prayed. No different. Uh, the next day, Tuesday, same thing, nothing. And then Wednesday, I kind of made the decision. I said, okay, I'm going to resolve this. I'm not going to stop until this is resolved. I want it fixed. And so, I started just seeking God, and then Wednesday night, I was laying in bed and I just started just um, going down to the core mechanics. Okay, well, how do you get saved? And up to this point, I had kind of been going from the direction of I need to make Jesus Christ the Lord of my life and let Him lead my life. And it just kind of hit me that, you know, that's, that's not salvation. That's a direct result of salvation. But that's not salvation because that's dependent on me. And salvation <coughs> cannot be dependent on me. You know, it can't be dependent on anything I've done, Him doing, or I'm going to. So it has to be dependent on Jesus Christ for this whole thing to work. And I then started to realize, oh, well then it's about what he's already done, not, not what I've done. And it's a free gift. And that was kind of hard for me to accept. Um, it's like, can I really take this gift? I mean, it's so huge and I, I can't repeat it. And before it was like this trade-off thing where, okay, I'll make you lower my life, and then you give me my golden ticket to heaven, and, and we're all good. But now it's like, oh. I can't, I can't repay this at all. And um, so I realized, I, and I finally got a point, I said, okay, well, I can accept that. So I did. And then, um, and then I, the question came to my head, well, how do you really know you're safe? I mean, you said you accept it, you know, you, but you've done that before. What's different? And I started thinking about that, and I thought, well, you would know by faith. And what is faith? And according to Hebrews 11, consists of belief and assurance. And so I started thinking, okay, well, what's the belief? Well, the belief is, well, first, that there is a God. You know, second, that the Bible is his word, and that Jesus Christ came 2,000 years ago to die for, for my sins and your sins and everyone's sins. And then came the assurance of, of that belief. And I was just thinking about that, and I got into this, this circular reasoning, which I'm still in. And uh, it was like, well, how are you assured of that belief? Because I believe it. And how do you believe it? Because I'm assured of it. And uh, <laughs> I couldn't get out of it. I still can't. And so now, you know, I can look at it and say, well, how do you know you're saved? And I say, how can I say I'm not saved? I mean, there's two options. Either I'm saved because he said I was saved, or I'm not and this whole thing is blown, which is impossible. So that's kind of how I knew I was saved. And I can now I can just go through, you know, I can go through like the, the Romans road that we've been going through. Um, the memory verses these last few weeks. You can go through Romans 23. All of sin and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 10. As it's written, there's none righteous, not even one. And then Romans 6.23. Uh, 
Galatians and his death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then Romans 5 8. Numbers and that God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 10 13. If anyone calls upon the name of the Lord, he will be saved. And then Romans 10 9 through 10. If anyone confesses with his mouth Jesus is Lord and believes in his heart that God raised him from the dead, he will be saved. For it is with the heart one believes, resulting in righteousness, but it is with the mouth one confesses, resulting in salvation. And I can look through that and I can say, yes, I'm a sinner, but yes, I've confessed. I've confessed Jesus is Lord and I believe what he said. So how can I not be saved? And so that's kind of the place I came to, and that was kind of the turning point. And uh, it, it was pretty cool. So um, I was still kind of in shock over the whole thing for the next, well, still in, but uh, especially over the next uh, week, week and a half, I just couldn't really believe. It's like, wow. It was pretty cool. So uh, since then, it's been, uh, it's been, you know, the, the four weeks ago, no? It's been the, you know, the most amazing four weeks of my life. I wouldn't trade the four weeks for, for the previous 18 years. So, um, you know, I've heard God's been working me through, you know, lots of things. There's been some changes that need to be made. Still a lot to go. I don't know where he's leading me. I have no idea. That was one of the things I had to kind of accept. Uh, for a while there, I was struggling with, you know, I needed direction to go. And I just didn't have that. God, I need somewhere to go because here I am. I've accepted you. Now where am I go? And uh, one day it just kind of came to me. You know, the Lord's prayer: "Give us this day our daily bread." And I realized I need to be content with having what I need for a day. And He's given me even more than that. I mean, I know what I need to be working on for life. I have stuff to work on forever. But uh, that's kind of where I'm at. So, with all that said, I want to say two things in wrapping up. One, I want to give a big thanks to Glenn and Christy. Without them, you know, if my story had stayed the same, I, I wouldn't be here today. So thank you, you guys. And then uh, for the rest of you, those who, who aren't sure of your salvation, I would just urge you to seek God and ask Him to convince you of that salvation. Because no matter how many things, you know, you, you know, you can say, well, if I turn to God, He'll make me change this and do this and not do this. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You won't regret it. So that's why. <laughs> experience with Josh over the last few weeks was a very strident reminder of how little I can actually do. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's easy to think the pastor or the elders or the deacons or the people you know that are in positions in the church have the answers. And, all I can do is point you to the one that has the answers. I can, I can talk to you about what he's done in my life. I can talk to you about what he's promised in the scriptures. And, and I think a lot of the problems with what, what we call cultural Christians is it's an external application of something that needs to reside internally. It needs to be birthed internally. Uh, you know, we can go through the motions of Christianity. Yeah, I go to church. I got a Bible. I got six of them. They're all up on the shelf for you. I pray, oh God, don't let me hit that deer. <laughs> you know, we have these cultural, these external applications that we kind of paintbrush our lives with. And because most often the church does, the church just says, yeah, that's it, you're good. We never get beyond that. And, you know, salvation is something that is birthed inside of us. Um, you know, and I, I don't want to disqualify emotion. Because there's oftentimes a lot of emotion at salvation. I mean, when you come face to face with your Savior and Lord, there can't help but be emotion. But the problem is, it's not always the same emotion. You know, the emotion that you have may be radically different than the emotion that I have. That was demonstrated in the difference 
salvation between Benjamin and Donovan. Benjamin was saved three months before Donovan. And uh, Benjamin was bouncing off the walls. He's screaming at child and bouncing off the walls. And Donovan just had a very quiet, tearful connection with God. Now, do I look at one and say, oh yeah, yours is real and yours is not? No. That's not my place. But I know that there needs to be emotion. Though. The problem is when we take the emotion as proof of the salvation. Okay? Um, there's always emotional moments in our lives. Some of us experience them significantly more than others. Some of you exhaust me with your ability to bounce back and forth in emotions. I, I don't understand it. Um, there are people in my family that I just, wow, it's no wonder you need to sleep so much. <laughs> Um, I tend not to get overly emotional about a lot of things. The older I get, and it seems like the less I get. I'm too tired to be angry. <laughs> Just go. <laughs> so I, but I don't want to disqualify that. Um, I just want to encourage you. If you're not sure of your salvation, just like Josh said, um, it's something that is birthed inside of you. You have to take it on faith. And you don't have to worry about bringing that faith up yourself because God gives you that faith. You have to believe that what he said is true. That if you confess with your mouth, if you believe in your heart, a belief unto change. Because keep in mind, we, we have a lot of people say, oh yeah, I believe Jesus is Lord, I believe in God, da 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 But, nothing changed. James chapter 2 says, you know, you say you believe, good for you. Because even the demons believe and shudder. So, you know, there, there's got to be something beyond just belief. So mm -hmm. I, I would just encourage you, you know, if you're not sure, but one of the best places to look, 1 John, read the book of 1 John. 1 uh, John just puts it in black and white. He just says, look, this, this is what a saved person should look like. And if you don't look like this, then you're over here with the Nazi. Okay? So, book of Colossians, chapter 4. We're going to attempt <laughs> to wrap it up. We're going to put it in a neat little package, put a bow on it, and I'm going to give it to you to take home and unpack and, and study and do with as God would have you. Okay? So, we are all the way down Colossians chapter 4. Verse 18. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Alright. Now my goal is to go through this verse and summarize Everything that came before that up to Colossians 1 1. Looking at this over the last few days, I gotta talk fast. <laughs> Remember my well first, let's start off with this. I Paul write this greeting with my own hand. I Paul write this greeting with my own hand. There is nothing in scripture that's there accidentally. There's nothing there that's without purpose. I Paul write this greeting with my own hand. I, I read a bunch of people's opinions about that. That's Paul saying he wrote the letter. That's Paul saying, no, I just, I signed it so you'd know that I'm actually the one, you know, he dictated it and he signed it so you know he actually gave it to you. It doesn't matter. Okay. Ultimately, it really doesn't matter because God chose this to be included in his word. Okay. So whether Paul dictated it, whether Paul just reassembled it out of other letters, the church to Laodicea, the church to Ephesians, it doesn't matter. Okay? God saw fit to take this writing and include it in his scriptures for us. So there's, there's significance here. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. You'd be amazed at people that look at that and go, oh, that can't be right. Paul didn't do that. Somebody else did it to give credence to their writings because they weren't as well known as Paul. I personally, I disagree with that. I'll tell you why. Because it's in God's Word. 
And God's word is truth. And if God includes lies in his word for us to try and weave in and out of, we end up with the Benjamin Franklin Bible. Okay? You've heard me talk about that. Benjamin Franklin, when he read the Bible, if he came across a part he didn't like, he highlighted it with black ink. <coughs> so he'd make sure to never see that again. Okay? And he customized his own Bible to suit his predisposed ideas. All right? So I, I have a problem with this, where people say, oh no, that's, that's, that's a lie. It's not a lie. Okay? I don't know whether Paul wrote the whole letter by hand. I, I tend to think he probably didn't. I think he dictated it. You know why? Chained yes, up. he was chained up. It's, it's kind of hard to write when you got a, a, another guy's arm hooked to you. This way. G! 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 <laughs> G! Good. Okay. So I, I think he tended to dictate it, but I think at the end, I think he actually wrote this. All right, come on. Okay, that's what I think happened. Oh, what I think is just an opinion. Feel free to discard it. That's okay. But ultimately, what it comes down to is I believe that Paul is responsible for this letter having been written. God using Paul. All right. So I'm going to go on to my next point here. Remember my chains. Now, it's funny because I had really planned on covering this last week. And I think God had a better plan. Because a couple of things came up this week that really drew attention to this passage of Scripture. Um, one of them, uh, we had our leadership meeting this week, and, and Steve was just, was just kind of burdened on his heart and shared with us about the persecuted church in the world. And, and all the different things that are going on globally. Now, um, I have some stats that I'm going to give to you here in a minute. Um, one of which is that, that Christianity is the most persecuted religion in the world. 165 countries allow for the persecution in measure of Christians. Some of them limiting what they're allowed to do that other people are allowed to do. Some of them where, you know, you go all the way up to North Korea, that it's illegal to be a Christian. Okay? So if you are a Christian in North Korea, it is expected that you will be punished, usually with labor camps. As we read about a week ago, um, 33 Christians in North Korea were sentenced to death for handing out tracts. They're, they're considered enemies of the state. They're trying to bring the state down. So 33 of them... Were, were given a death sentence. Um, I have not heard anything since then. I don't know if it's been carried out. I, I have no clue. Uh, but the Washington Times uh, stated that there were 33 as a direct result of this Southern Baptist missionary from Australia. Um, he actually was set free. Thank God for that. He has been set free. Uh, last I heard, he was in China getting ready to be restored back to his family in Australia. So that's, that's a blessing. But the 33... North Koreans, their, their expectation is a bull. Okay. Um, so Steve was sharing this with us and, and just the burden on his heart. And, and I, I, I really appreciate that because that's been a burden that's been on my heart. God has been growing this in me um, for, for about a year and a half. For the concern for our brothers and sisters in places that, that don't have the freedom and the liberty that we do. But one of the things that... Uh, happened after that is, is Thursday night in the brothers meeting. Dennis was sharing a video, uh, Ray Vanderlaan, and it said, um, what was the name of it? Don't Forget Us? Mm -hmm. Don't Forget Us. And it was talking about uh, persecution in the early church, and then one of the gals that was in this group with Ray Vanderlaan was from southern Sudan. Okay? And her family, her father was killed in the fighting between the Muslims and the Christians. Uh, her mother was killed, she had friends killed, she was actually forced to make a trek, uh, saw horrific things, and um, very, very stark reality about what some Christians have to face in the world. Now, one of the things that was significant, and I think this was probably, for me, why God put this off from last week to this week, because one of the things that Ray Vandalon said that really struck me, struck a chord in me, and has, has given me a lot to ponder and pray about since Thursday, is this. 
um, Ray Vanderlaan said it, it really bothers him when people say, well, we're not being persecuted. And, and I've, I've heard that. As a matter of fact, I've even said that. And he made a, a, a very good point that made me kind of rethink a lot of things. Uh, his, his opinion is that if you understand that you are not being persecuted, you're either ignorant or selfish. Okay? Because, see, you're either ignorant of what the body of Christ is, or you're selfish in that you just don't care. Because, see, the body of Christ is one unit. And, you know, in um, 1 Corinthians 12, I'm going to flip it. Don't, don't bother flipping there. I'll read it for you. But uh, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 26. I want to read to you what Paul writes. He's talking about the body. He's talking about, in the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, nor can the ear say to the mouth, I have no need of you. He's saying we're all necessary components for the functionality of the body of Christ. He's called us each with unique gifts, unique talents, to help the body work <coughs> properly. And he gets down to verse 26, and he says, If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now, if we really understand what the body of Christ is, and we have persecution ongoing in 165 nations around the world, and we have estimates, I've heard estimates everywhere from 10,000 to 100,000 Christians are killed on average a year. Okay? Because they're Christians. Now, that's not talking about you're a Christian, a guy walks in the store to rob it and shoots you because you happen to be in the way. That's, that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about people that are killed specifically because they're Christians. Okay, And that's why the, there's such a great difference in the numbers. Because some of them include the wars, uh, for example, in Sudan, where the Muslims are attacking the Christians and the Christians are attacking the Muslims. Uh, some of them include those numbers. Okay, Some of them include numbers where Christians of one particular type are attacking Christians of another particular type. That's just crazy to me. Okay. But ultimately, somewhere between 10,000 and 100,000 Christians are being killed a year because they are Christians. So if one member suffers, all suffer together. See, that's where I've had my eyes open and why I think God has been birthing in me such a heart for the persecuted church. Because I, we should all have a heart for those that are suffering. Um, you know, we, we prayed uh, over a year ago. Do you, does anybody here remember Pastor Saeed? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you know he's still in jail? Mm -hmm. Did you know that? It's been over a year that he's been in jail because he is a Christian. Um, this week he was actually released to go to a hospital. He was not allowed to receive treatment at the hospital. He was there for two days and then was taken back to the prison. The international community set up such a, a ruckus that they sent him right back to the hospital within, within a day. Okay. Um, now what's sad about this is the number one supporter of Christianity in America should be the United States of America. In almost, a, almost two years, we're coming up on two years, we've had two public statements from officials in the United States regarding this. Two public statements, okay? One by John Kerry and one by President Obama. Unfortunately, neither one was followed up with much of anything. What's really sad is the European community has come out more uh, verbal in their opposition to this than America has in the United States. <clears throat> And I think that's a sad indictment to where our country stands. Um, but it's, you know, we were praying a lot for him a year ago. Uh, I get emails probably three, four times a week concerning what, what's going on with him. Uh, I get emails from Voice of the Martyrs. Okay. Do you want to know what's going on in the world? Subscribe to Voice of the Martyrs. Uh, I get emails from Asian Harvest which deals specifically with China, but also some of the surrounding countries. Um, I also get emails from uh, uh, called Asia. Okay? And every week, I'm getting 
the stories about Christians that are being persecuted. And, and we're talking, you know, um, children that are accepting the Lord and are being beat up by their father. Because you're not supposed to do that. Uh, we're talking about families that are being kicked out of their communities because they accept God. They accept this Christianity and they're, they're removed from their community. These are Christians who um, family members are being killed because they're Christians. And all of a sudden, dad's no longer going to be home. Dad's never coming back because he's given his heart to the Lord and the state has taken his life. Okay. So when we read that statement, remember my chains, it should automatically open up for us what is going on in the body of Christ. Because, see, we are so insulated in our comfort zone. We, we get offended when it looks like the state is going to cut in on some of our privileges. Some of the rights that we have as Americans. And we get our backs up and we get our nose in the air. And something that concerns me is that's not persecution, folks. That, that's not persecution. Okay? Because ultimately what we have to do, regardless of what the laws are, we have to do. We have to profess our Lord and Savior. He, that's a command. He's told us we have to do that. Okay? We have to know His Word. That's, that's the stabil, stability, the stable platform which He has given us to stand on in this life. Okay? We have to know his word. In order to know his word, what do you have to do? You have to have his word. You have to be reading his word. You have to be in it. Okay? That's why we're doing memory verses. One of the stories that I read when I was younger, I was about 15 years old, was about, um, I don't remember, it was, either his first name was Zechariah or his last name was Zechariah. It was a man that was shot down in Vietnam and was put into the, the little <clears throat> cubicles and lived on pumpkin soup. And uh, one of the things that amazed me about his story was he had, he had quit going to church when he was a teenager. And life got in the way and, and things intervened and, and things just got busy and he quit going to church. He never really considered himself not a Christian. He just quit going to church, quit being in fellowship. And when he got to spend a lot of quality time with God, because there's not really many other people to spend time with when you're locked in a little by three room and you're not allowed to communicate with the people on either side of you, um, something strange happened. All those verses that he had memorized when he was young started coming back to him. And he was amazed at how many Bible verses he was able to recall and promises that he was able to stand on and things that he was able to cling to in hope. Okay, now, when he was released and he came home, uh, some of the horrific things that happened to him, a lot of people want to read the stories for the horrific things that happened to him, but quite honestly, I think what is a better part of the story is what happened when he was released and he came home, how his, his life flourished, how his entire outlook on life changed because, see, he went into a dark place and God shined a light in that dark place. Okay? And he, he came to understand what Christianity was all about. Okay, what this faith is all about. So, um, this is why every week we give you memory verses. Um, this is why we encourage you, every day you should be in the Word. Get a good reading program. I, I, don't, I don't care, you know. If you're a, a slow reader, get one that takes two years to get through the Bible. That's fine. That's okay. But do it. Get into His Word. Um, you know, if you're a fast reader, do it quicker. Spend time in the Word. But don't just let your eyes move over the page. Contemplate on it. Meditate on it. Let it seep in. Okay? So, what Paul says, remember my chains. He's speaking personally to the church at Colossae because he's literally in chains in Rome. And there's really uh, an, an expectation on the one hand that this might be it, but there's also kind of this confidence on the other hand that maybe it's not. Because he still has a hope to be able to get out and see the Colossians. His desire is to go and see other people, to, to continue on in the work. That's one of my favorite passages. I love the simplicity of Paul's faith. Okay? Which is amazing when you consider the man that wrote Romans 
has a simplicity of faith. What it comes down to is this. Look, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Alright? To live is Christ, to die is gain. Better for you that I live, that I can continue to minister on your behalf, but better for me that I should die and enter into his eternal glory. Okay? So, when we're talking about remember my chains, I would encourage you, you have to know what's going on. You have to know what's going on. Take a look. Get into contact. Uh, I try and get the Voice of the Martyrs magazine. I put it up here each time I get it. This last one, I didn't because someone who shall remain nameless spilled something all over it. <laughs> and, it. And, and I'm not allowed to tell you that it was one of my grandchildren. <laughs> okay. Um, that eliminates all but one of them. So there's still a 33 and a third percent chance you're wrong. So I would encourage you, find out what's going on. But don't just get the information here. <coughs> Lift those people up. Lift our brothers and sisters up in prayer. Look, a, a lot of times we go, well, I don't ever really have a lot to pray about. I'm sure Vivian would love to share her list. <laughs> you know, I, I, for years, was not a prayer. Um, I, I really struggled with prayer. And over the last four or five years, God has birthed in me a desire to pray. Um, you know, I, you all know I don't sleep a lot at night. I sleep in about one and a half, two hour snatches, and then I wake for a while, sometimes half an hour, sometimes two or three hours. And then I go back to sleep for a couple hours, and then I'm awake again. God has used that time to, to, for me to devote to prayer, and, and to pray about things, to pray about people, to uh, lift up a lot of times you guys, to lift up a lot of times those that are suffering overseas, particular stories that I've heard about, particular stories that I've read about, things that I know. So, you know, if you are willing, God will birth in you a praying person. Okay? If you're not sure about it, ask to be made willing to be willing. Because he'll do that too. Because that's something that I had to do. I said, God, I, I'm not a prayer. I don't understand these people that... That's all they want to do is pray, 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 pray. God, I tell you what, what's on my mind and, and we're done in about 17 seconds. <laughs> I don't have a lot on my mind. And in that 17 seconds, 16 of it is say, taken up with God, give me this, God, give me that, God, do this for me, God, do this. And then there's that other part that starts, dear God, and ends, thank you, Lord. And, and God is, my prayer was God would change that in me and he's changing that in me. Um, I, I don't know that I'm ever going to be the intercessor that I see in Vivian and that I see in my wife. But I know that God is birthing in me a desire to be in communication with him. Okay? So, remember my chains. Paul's plea to the Colossians, Paul's plea, God's directive to us to remember those that are persecuted around this world. They are our brothers and sisters. You know, you... Uh, Stick your hand out here and let me hit it with a hammer. Mm. I bet you your whole body reacts. Matter of fact, I bet you a lot of the bodies out here would react. <laughs> so, a couple stats to give you just about um, persecution. Um, 2005 alone. The Journal of Missionary Research says 171,000 Christians were martyred. Okay? Uh, it's estimated that over 200 million Christians are being persecuted worldwide. Uh, earlier I made a reference to the statistic, uh, 165 countries that Christians are persecuted in. The next largest faith that is being persecuted is the Muslims, and they're at 143 countries where they are suffering persecution. Okay? So when you hear a lot of this, oh, you know, you don't know what the Muslims have had it like. Yeah, we do, because the Christians are it like that in just as many or more countries. Okay? Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not endorsing persecution 
in any form. And it's, it's kind of sad because a lot of the countries where Christians are welcome happen to be the same countries where other faiths are persecuted. And I think that is a black eye to the Christian church. Okay? It's a black eye to the Christian church. Ultimately, vengeance is God's. Okay? That's his to do. Ours is to get the message to them. Not to make them receive the message. That, that, that's not our responsibility. Our job is to deliver it. Okay? Sent out ones. That's what we are. Sent out. We're the ambassadors. We're the one giving the message, taken to deliver it to them. That's our job. Okay? Um, so, 165 countries. Um, in 2010, there were entire villages that were <coughs> massacred at the authority of the government of Nigeria, which is a Muslim government. The government decided that it was okay to wipe them out. They wouldn't convert, so they were wiped out. Um, from 2000 to 2002, directly at the hands of Muslims, over 10,000 Christians were slaughtered. Okay? Directly at the hands of Muslims because they would not convert. Um, this, is, this is actually a little bit older statistic. Uh, half of Iraq's Christians have fled the country since the fall of Saddam Hussein. That number is actually up now to almost 95%. Okay? 95% of the Christians in Iraq are gone. They've left because of the rampant persecution. Okay? 95%. So, Paul says, remember my chains. Grace be with you. Now, I, I tend to, you know, I've already shared with you, I tend to, when we get to these parts of the epistles, I tend to kind of blink over them because it's like, Oh, tell Aunt Bessie I love her, you know, and and uh, love you a lot. See you later. That's that's because that's kind of how we conclude our letters. But he says, "Grace be with you." That statement is not something that we can give lightly. We cannot treat with that lightly. It says, "Grace be with you." What is this grace that he is talking about? Okay, you know, when when somebody sneezes, what do you say? Bless you. Bless you. Okay. Do you ever think about that? Do you ever think about, you know, if we're being formal and, and proper etiquette, what do we say? About you. God bless you. Okay. Have you ever thought about what that even means? What we're actually asking? We're asking that God would bless them because they sneeze? <laughs> but, but you see what, what happens is we tend to make light of something because it becomes ritualistic. It becomes every day. I mean, when somebody sneezes, you say, bless you, and your brain doesn't even engage with that. You don't even engage with the fact that you're asking God to bless them and what all that might entail. What if that blessing entails much more hardship? you, Boy, I hope things get rough for you. <laughs> well, you understand that could be a blessing, right? Can hardship be a blessing? Absolutely. I'll tell you what, I would play, pray hardship. If it is going to drive you to God, then I pray hardship over each and every one of you. God allows hardship in our lives to grow us, to discipline us, to teach us that we can trust in Him. That He is faithful. Okay? Or, or do I mean, because most of the time when we say bless you, we're actually talking about giving them good things, right? You really want some of those people getting good things? I mean, the jerk you work with that has nothing but profanity coming out of his mouth, he's cheating on his wife, you want him to get good things? Watch your mouth. That's okay to say, I hope hardships come on you. But see, the same thing happens here. Grace. Grace. What is this grace? Grace be with you. When Paul says that, he's not given just a bless you. He's not just throwing something out thoughtlessly. What is this grace? Flip over to Ephesians chapter 2 real quick. I want to touch on this too. 
just a little bit. Chapter 2, and I'm going to pick up about verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. See, let, let's go back up to verse 8 there. For by grace you have been saved. For by grace you have been saved. See, what Paul is saying right here is that he wants salvation to be with them. He wants them to live in that salvation that is theirs. He wants God's grace. You know that little acronym? Has everybody know the little acronym for what grace means? G-R-A-C-E. It's God's riches at Christ's expense. Okay? A simple way to remember what grace is, is that you get something you didn't deserve. The opposite side of that coin is mercy. You don't get something you did deserve. Okay? So, in grace, did we deserve heaven? No. No. Did we deserve forgiveness? No. no. Did we deserve to have Christ go to the cross on our behalf? No. See, that's what grace is. That all these things were done for us. The flip side of that is mercy. What did we deserve? We deserve punishment. Because we offended God. We have broken His righteous law, His righteous requirements. We deserve to go to the cross all on our own, not to have anybody stand in for us. We deserve punishment that would separate us from God for eternity. That's what we deserve. But in His mercy, He didn't give us that. In His grace, He gave us better. Okay? He gave us a way to be restored to Him. He gave us a way that an eternal relationship with Him could be established. Okay? That's the miracle of salvation. That's the, the whole miracle of the cross. That's why we revel in the cross, despite the horrific history of it. You know, what we see up here, uh, this is the, the, the sanitized version. Okay? Because we don't see the person that is nailed to that cross that is, that is slowly suffocating to death. Okay? We don't see the abuse that was heaped upon him. We, we have the sanitized version. And a lot of times that becomes a blessing to us. Just like the grace becomes a blessing to us. So when Paul wraps up his letter, he says, Grace be with you. He is actually giving them heartfelt, thought-provoking blessing. It's this grace that I am extending to you. I want you guys to live in this. Okay? So we wrapped up the last verse. Look at that. We still have a few minutes. <clears throat> We're going to summarize. We're going to summarize. When we started off in Colossians, I told you there were several things that Paul was going to address. Anybody remember what they were? Because it was, you know, a year ago. Gnosticism? <laughs> What's that? Gnosticism. 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 Gnosticism is alive and well today. Anybody remember what Gnosticism is? Anybody? Gnosticism is uh, secret knowledge. Okay? It, it's a cult that grew up. Uh, at this time, it was just getting started. Uh, basically, what they were doing is, is a method called syncretism, where they take an existing belief, and they append another belief to it and try and blend them together. And what was going on was there was this belief that you could uh, have an in with whatever deity that you were serving by having secret knowledge. 
And what they were doing was they were trying to take this and they were trying to blend it with the doctrines of Christianity. And there was this secret knowledge that you could have that would ensure your salvation, but it only was given to you through the masters. Okay? You couldn't get it on your own. It had to be given to you. And, and interestingly enough, when you get back to the root of it, this knowledge was actually handed down to the masters through angelic mediators. Does that sound like anything you guys might know about? Hmm. Yeah, Gnosticism is alive and well today. Okay? Paul addresses that in, in several different places. The biggest area that he's dealing with this is in uh, chapter 2, verses 18 through 23. He nails them point for point for point. I'm not going to have you guys look at that on your own. We've already talked about it previously. But he's addressing the pre-Gnostic movement, trying to, to blend Christianity with mysterious, mystic knowledge, secret knowledge. Okay. And what's the other thing that I told you that he was willing to deal with? He's confronting. That's something that actually came up in a number of his letters. <coughs> Judaizers. Now, in the brothers' meeting, we actually got to see this uh, in a couple of the, the videos that we've watched. Because um, when Paul took his first missionary journey, um, he goes up to, was it Lystra, correct? Mm -hmm. And then from Lystra, he went all the way down, and, and there were several other cities. He ended up in, Dur was it Derby? Mm -hmm. 150 miles away, okay? And, and they're walking. Now, what's interesting about this is when he gets to Lystra, the people receive his message with gladness. But a couple days after he gets there, what happens? Some of the people that disagreed with him from Lystra followed him all the way to Derby. And they threw the city in an uproar. Because they didn't like what he was teaching. Why? Because he wasn't teaching for pure Judaism anymore. He was teaching that there's some way other than the fulfillment of the law. And, and in order to receive... What, what really was there, you had to be a Jew, or at least a proselyte of the Jews. Snippy, snippy, guys. Okay? That's, that's one of the things that they were requiring. You, you want this salvation? Guess what? Snip, snip. you got to submit yourself. Paul addresses that rather harshly in Galatians uh, chapter 5. When talking about the Judaizers, he says, I, I wish they'd go the whole way and cut them. So they emasculate themselves. Cut the whole thing off. For all the good it's going to do them. Snippy, snippy, no. Just lop, lop. <laughs> okay? We see this also in chapter 2. We see in uh, chapter 2, verse 11. I'm going to hit this real quick. And 16. I just want to read these over real quick for you. Chapter 2, verse 11 says, In him... Also you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. See, he's addressing Judaizers right there. Look, you don't need any physical thing to happen to be saved. Nothing physical. We jump down a few verses in uh, verse 16. He says, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in question of food or drink, or with regard to a festival or a new moon Sabbath. These are the shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. See, see he's addressing what the Jews are trying to get these new believers to do. Well, if you're going to be a Christian, first you have to have the physical process done. Then there has to be an adherence to our laws. So you've got to remember the Sabbath, and you've got to remember this feast, and you've got to remember that feast, and you got to, not only do you have to remember them, you have to do all these things in order to hold to them correctly. And Paul's saying, no, 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 no. That's not what this is about. Okay? So we see that he's addressing these two particular issues in this letter to the Colossians. Why is he addressing them to them? Because they had people there that were trying to promote them. Okay? Why is it in God's Word? Because we still see these kinds of things happening today. How many of you have ever had, don't put your hand up, I don't want to see it. How many of you have ever been told that in order to be a Christian, you can or can't do certain things? You know, I grew up in, in, a, in a time where, you know, Jimmy Swaggart wouldn't let you listen to certain types of music. Oh, no. Because the rhythm is wrong. And that rhythm comes from Africa, and it's on the offbeat, it's demonic. Yeah. 
You know how much music I missed out on. <laughs> Not a lot. Sorry, Scott, but I still can't stand the, the heavy metal stuff. Wait, what, what's the Scott stuff? <laughs> I don't like it. <laughs> And I, I could say Christopher, but he's not in here. <laughs> okay? But we still have that going on today. In order to be a Christian, you can't do this, or you can't do that. And it has nothing to do with what's in Scripture. All of a sudden, there's this, this uh, hermeneutic gymnastics taking place in order to make something that doesn't say what it clearly says, say what they want it to say, so you won't do what they don't want you to do. Try to say that three times. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? All of a sudden, they're, they're you know, manipulating this to say what they want it to say because that particular thing bothers them. Now, quite honestly, I'm, I'm going to try to throw a stumbling block for you. I'm not trying to throw a stumbling block. But that might be sin for them. Okay, That might be. They may have a deep held conviction not to do this. And I won't hold them up in judgment of that. And you should not hold them up in judgment of that either. Okay? But, neither should you submit yourself under that judgment. You do need to be cautious though. Now, here's, here's where things get really tricky. In order to not cause them to stumble, you being the more mature one, should not do those things in their presence that they would not stumble. Okay? For example, I don't drink alcohol. You know why? I don't like it. Pure and simple. I get it right about here and I go, Ugh. Pepsi please. Okay. Now, I, I have never liked it. I don't, you know. But quite honestly, every other person in my family, not my children, my wife, my brothers and sisters and parents, they drink alcohol. And when we get together, I have never seen any of them drunk. But they'll, they'll you know, my dad was always a whiskey sour. My mom was a frozen brandy Alexander. Then they moved to Texas and both of them drank, te not tequila, what is that called? <laughs> Margarita? Margaritas. Whatever that is. Okay? I don't care. I personally, I don't care. I don't have a problem with it. Scripture doesn't say don't drink. What scripture says is do not be drunk. Okay? Now, if you have a personal calling to not drink, don't drink. Okay? Don't. Because that would be sin for you. So don't. As a matter of fact, if you are one of those people, come and talk to me. Because I'm going to make sure we don't ever put you in a point where that would be a problem. Okay? Um, I, I, that actually happened one time. There was a, a certain person that we used to know that liked <coughs> moose drool. <laughs> Shouldn't the name give you insight? <laughs> really? The name should give you insight. But they, so, to honor that person, we had moose drool in the refrigerator. Well, somebody else came to our house that was a no-no-no. And they saw that, and that caused a problem. Okay? So, uh, what do I do? I took it out of the refrigerator and stuck it behind some things and covered it up until they left. And I put it back in the refrigerator so it would be cold for when the person that wanted it came. Okay? Now, I don't have a problem with it. I don't do it. Okay? If you have a problem with it, don't do it. If you don't have a problem with it, be responsible. Be mature. If, if somebody comes into your house with an issue, hey, don't, don't rail on them for being immature. Don't rail on them for, oh, you know, you're making much ado about nothing. Be the mature one. Set it away. Set it aside. Okay? So, one other thing I want to talk about in summarizing this, and this is seven different points, actually one point in seven different places. Colossians 1.3, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Don't turn there because we're going to be skipping all over. Colossians 1.12, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in life. Colossians 2.7, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Colossians 3.15, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. Colossians 3.16 Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one, other, one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs 
with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Uh, Colossians 3, 17. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. <laughs> Colossians 4, 2. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Did you guys catch a theme? Did you catch a theme there? Being thankful. Did you know that that appears in every chapter of these four books, these four chapters of this book? Every chapter, Paul reminds us, be thankful, being thankful, give thanks. We should be the most thankful people in the world because we have the most to be thankful for. If nothing other than salvation, we would still have the most to be thankful for. But he doesn't just stop at salvation. <clears throat> James also tells us that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of Heaven. Right? Every good and perfect gift. Everything that is good, God puts in our lives. Okay? He doesn't just stop at salvation. Jesus even makes a, a, a corollary. He says, you know, when, when you ask your father, he said, you know, if your child asks you for a loaf of bread, which of you would give him a stone? But if you know how to give good gifts, how much more does your father have to know how to give good, give good gifts? Okay? You, you see what I'm saying? We have a lot to be thankful for. One of the disciplines that I would encourage you, as a matter of fact, I would, I would strongly recommend that you do. Count your blessings. Make a list. Write them down. Every time you think of a new one, add it to the list. When you're not really sure you're having a down day, go back and read the list. Just physically, make a list. You'd be amazed at how much we have to be thankful for. You would absolutely be amazed at how much we have to be thankful for. So, we come to the end of Colossians. <clears throat> haven't said nearly as much as it deserves. I've said probably significantly more than you ever wanted to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Little book, four chapters. Probably read it in about 35 minutes. But God has packed so much of what He desires of us, how He instructs us, His love for us, in that little book. Absolutely amazing. Father.